Good morning, everybody. This is less than the 99% sellout that they said it was going to be, but um, definitely a great crowd. So thank you for taking the time this morning to uh, spend it with myself and uh, Nick Biazzini. Um, I know it's early. Like, how many people partied last night? Like, I don't do the parties at RSA anymore. Like, I drink club soda for like a week and like I go to sleep early. But how many people, good parties last night? Uh, a little hungover? <laughs> not, not too bad? Okay. Um, I talk fast. I want to make this fun. I want to make it um, kind of interactive if possible. We're going to try to save time for questions at the end. Um, everything's fair game. Like if I can't ask it or I don't know or Nick doesn't know, we'll say I don't know or good question or we'll follow up with that. But um, definitely want you guys to feel like you have an opportunity um, to ask questions. So. Um, <clears throat> Oh, also, just um, normally we're used to having like confidence monitors down in front, so we know what slide is coming up next. If you see, there's no confidence monitors here, so just full disclosure, I don't like to stand behind the lectern. I might kind of pop back and forth or look up here to see what slide I have and those sorts of things. It's because like I got to figure out where I'm at in my presentation, in case you're wondering. Okay, um, so in a second, I'm going to be joined by my colleague Nick Biazzini, uh, who is head of global outreach for Talos, um, which is a large threat intelligence organization from Cisco. You probably know. Uh, my name is AJ Shipley. I'm the head of product for the detection and response portfolio at Cisco. Um, within that portfolio are things like endpoint detection and response, and extended detection and response, and network detection and response, and email security, and sandboxing, and vulnerability management, and probably some other things that I'm forgetting about. Um, <clears throat> but what I want to do today is I want to actually take my Cisco hat off and not talk to you as an employee of Cisco and actually talk to you as a member of the security community that I am a part of um, and that all of you are a part of. Um, and before I do that, uh, I want to maybe just kind of ask a question or a show of hands. So um, how many of you in the audience, um, this is your first RSA? Oh, wow. Welcome to RSA. Like, it is amazing. Um, yeah, lots of good uh, conversations, lots of vendor stuff, lots of great parties, um, good dinners. So welcome to RSA. Super um, happy to have you join this community of security folks. Um, how many of you five or more RSAs? OK, 10 or more? OK, a few. Like, this is probably around 10 for me. So. For those of you who this is not your first RSA, um, you probably walk around and you recognize there's a thousand vendors out there, or more this year, that uh, are promising that they can solve all of our security problems. Cisco's actually probably one of those vendors saying we can solve all of your security problems. Uh, last year, there were a thousand vendors who were promising that they could solve all of our security problems. The year before that, for those of you who are new, the first one, the year before that, there were about 1,000 vendors, maybe a little bit less, keeps getting bigger every year, that were saying that they could solve all of our security problems. And as far as I can tell, so far, we have not solved all of our security problems. Um, and it's not for lack of trying. It's not because we don't have really, really smart people trying to do this, either building products for customers or really, really smart people who are consuming those products to try to keep their organization safe. Um, all of you are in this room. You're highly dedicated to this craft. You're here to learn. You're here to um, meet new people, share ideas, exchange. Um, but this is a really, really hard problem. And it's hard because of how interconnected we are. So like, I have a phone in my pocket, which works really great because it's always connected. But I can't tell you how many smishing messages, SMS phishing messages, I've gotten in the last six months. If you're like me, like they're getting really, really good. And I could disconnect my phone and turn it off and not have to worry about getting exploited, but then my phone's not very good any, anymore to me. And so it's only because we're interconnected in this interconnected nature of society that things work. And this is how we see ourselves. We see ourselves as like a fraternity and a sorority of security professionals who are focused on preserving our way of life. But here's how the adversary sees us. They see us as an ever-expanding attack surface that is ripe for exploitation. Let me put it in perspective for you. So I was talking to a customer a couple of weeks ago over breakfast. They, are fire, they have a firewall of ours. And they said, since the pandemic, the number of firewall rules that they've had to maintain in their firewall has increased by 3x. Now, some of you who are responsible for managing firewalls, you know that like firewall rule tables are 10,000 lines long. 
and they're a bear to, to manage. You know, there were exceptions that were put in there 10 years ago by somebody who no longer works at the company. You don't know why they were there, but you know you sure as hell better not take it out. Because if you take it out, something bad might happen to the organization. Well, now that's gone up to 30,000 because people are accessing from new locations, remote work, and so they've had to punch all of these pinholes into their firewall rule tables and massively expand these firewall rule tables. And the adversary views this as a huge expanding attack surface that is ripe for exploitation. This is a challenge that faces us. I'll also tell you, last year there were 25,000 vulnerabilities that were enumerated in the National Vulnerability Database. 25,000 opportunities in code for an adversary to exploit the code and do something malicious. That's up from about 18,000 in 2020 and 6,500 in 2015. So what do we do? Do we stop writing software? No, I don't think that's the answer. And I have not met a single engineer who writes software with the intention of shipping it with, with vulnerabilities in it. No, no software developer wants to write code that can be exploited. It's because this is a really, really hard problem that we're faced with. <clears throat> and it's not getting any easier because the adversary is very sophisticated. But increasingly, even less sophisticated adversaries have access to very sophisticated tactics. So just to put it in perspective, the tactics and techniques that were once the domain of nation-state-sponsored, highly, very, very well, highly resourced adversaries that were targeting other nation-states are now in the hands of really anybody. So we've all heard of ransomware. Many of us deal with trying to keep ransomware out of the environment if we're on the customer side and we're protecting it. Many of us build products to try to keep ransomware from being able to, to, to land in an environment. Show of hands again, how many have heard of WannaCry? Okay, a lot of you. Not, what not everybody knows is that WannaCry was actually a derivative of the eternal blue SMB exploit that was developed by the National Security Agency that was leaked out on the public internet by a group called Shadow Brokers, right? So that very, very sophisticated weaponized exploit developed by the best resourced organization, nation state adversary in the world was now basically in the public domain. And what we saw was it led to ransomware, led to WannaCry and the proliferation of that, and now we're all dealing with it. <clears throat> and I haven't even talked about some of these advanced technologies, which are all the rage at RSA this year, right? Like generative AI, chat GPT. And where we used to be able to rely on bad grammar to be able to detect that phishing scheme, right, from an email perspective, now you can ask ChatGPT, and our marketing you know, friends you know, are helping us on the product side are using generative AI in order to craft like very, very well-targeted email marketing campaigns, but the adversaries have access to that same technology to say, write me a phishing email impersonating a CEO to the CFO saying, I need you to do this wire transfer immediately. <clears throat> and that's a very like basic sort of attack that people are doing. I saw there was a researcher a couple of weeks ago who used generative AI <clears throat> to write a piece of malware by just giving it a few prompts. Like I said, do this, do this, do this, and generative AI generated code for a piece of malware. <clears throat> so these are the advanced technologies that are advancing at such a rapid pace that they also have access to. This highlights the really, really hard problem that faces all of us. And because you're here, you believe probably like me that not only can XDR, extended detection and response, potentially unite this industry, but I would suggest that it has to unite this industry if we want to protect our way of life as a member of this security community. And the reason that this is so personal for me, and I'll leave you with this before I call Nick up to share a little bit about an incident that we dealt with at Cisco. But the reason that this is so personal for me is because <clears throat> probably like many of you, um, especially if you're on the product side, you are a customer of your customer. I'm a customer of my customers. Here's what I mean by that. I live here in the Bay Area. <clears throat> I have a house here in the Bay Area. My mortgage is held by one of the largest financial service organizations in the world that's headquartered out here in San Francisco. My family goes to a hospital, a health maintenance organization, out here in California. So myself and my whole family go to that health maintenance organization. That hospital system and that financial services organization are customers of Cisco. But I'm a customer of theirs. Meaning it's not just my obligation to keep them secure, 
But really, in so doing, I'm keeping myself and my family secure. Because if they get compromised, then potentially my mortgage gets compromised, or my health records get compromised, or somebody does something malicious with my prescriptions, and then my family and my friends and my loved ones and all of you are compromised. And that's why we're all in this together. This is why it's personal for me. This is why I wanted to spend this time with you guys and talk about why I think I need your help and we all need each other's help in order to force our community to better come together to fight this scourge that we're faced with. Now with that, I'm gonna invite my friend Nick Biazzini up to the stage. He's gonna share with you something that we dealt with at Cisco that even the largest, best resourced organizations in the world are struggling with because adversaries are getting really, really sophisticated. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to be very transparent with you and tell you that if it can happen to us, it can happen to you. We're not standing up here saying that like, we've got it all figured out because we don't have it all figured out. But what I do know is if we work together, we can figure it out collectively. Nick? Oh, clicker. I got a mic. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, AJ. So, my name is Nick Biasini. I'm gonna talk to you about an incident. Uh, so on May 24th, Cisco became aware of a potential compromise. Uh, and I'm kinda, gonna kinda walk through what happened, what we saw, and what we've learned, and kind of how that is setting the tone for our vision for XDR. So at a high level, this is kind of what happened. Uh, the campaign began, Eventually, they were able to access Cisco servers via the VPN. They were able to successfully escalate privileges, and then uh, were trying to do extortion ransomware type activity. But let's kind of go a little bit deeper. When we talk about these types of breaches with these types of, of organizations, right, everybody's kind of thought process typically falls into three buckets, right? Supply chain. Supply chain is incredibly effective. We still see it being used widely. I mean, 3CX, Trader Technologies, it's in the news as recently as the last couple of weeks. The thing with supply chain, though, is you're typically going to cast a very wide net, right? Your goal here is to compromise a large amount of targets, gather some information, decide who you actually want to target with true malicious intent. We didn't see that in this case. One of the other key things that you're gonna see is spear phishing attacks. AJ just talked about ChatGPT and the generative AIs that are out there. These types of lures and the ability for adversaries to build incredibly effective, very targeted emails at key individuals is just going to get more and more common as the years go on. Again, in this case, we didn't see that. And then finally, AJ mentioned there were 25,000 CVEs in the last year. Active exploitation continues to be the most common way that we see adversaries getting into these environments. Now, a lot of times these are known vulnerabilities, right? These are things that you haven't had a chance to patch yet in your environment. Maybe you have a lab system that got stood up that doesn't have the proper patching applied. Maybe somebody rolled back a patch trying to troubleshoot an issue. Regardless, we see adversaries take advantage of those mistakes that you make. And then in extreme circumstances, right, this is where your zero day attacks are gonna fall in. This is where your most sophisticated groups are gonna use unknown vulnerabilities that don't have patches available or detections in place to try and compromise your networks. However, these three categories that commonly get associated with this does not represent the complex, complicated environments that we're forced to defend today. So what actually did happen? How did it all come about? Um, as you all are aware, hybrid work is everywhere. People are working from places all over the planet, using disparate systems to log into those resources. And one of the things that we commonly see from a user perspective is things like browser password syncing. Now I understand from a user perspective why this is an attractive avenue, right? Now you can say, just log into your Google Chrome account once you have access to all your passwords. Instead of having to remember a whole bunch of passwords, you only have to remember one. And you can log in incredibly quickly. You can sit down at a system, open up Chrome, and have access to everything you need very, very quickly. The problem is, is it increases your attack surface. AJ talked again about how the attack surface is continuing to expand. And in this case, what we had was an employee who used this password syncing in the browser and unfortunately stored their Cisco corporate credentials 
in the password browser, or in the browser password manager, which would be fine, except their Google account was compromised. So when this Google account gets compromised, something that happens to individuals around the planet all the time, every day, they then exposed the Cisco credentials. Luckily, as you may have guessed, we happen to have multi-factor authentication in place. So adversaries with credentials aren't going to be able to, to immediately inflict damage. If we didn't have MFA, it would have been a much, much more difficult story because adversaries would have had access with far less hurdles in place. But MFA creates a challenge. Uh, adversaries have really started to take advantage of different novel ways to try and defeat MFA. We saw a variety of different attacks. MFA fatigue is a great example. We all have MFA on our phones, I hope. Uh, and enterprises are continuing to adopt it widely. We're all used to getting those notifications when you go to log in, you immediately pull out your phone ready to hit that checkbox saying, okay, I'm ready to log in. Now imagine you start getting one of those pings every three minutes. And imagine that goes on for, I don't know, three hours. Now imagine it's two o'clock in the morning and your phone is lighting up every three minutes. Now imagine you're an admin and you're on call or you have an elderly parent that has health issues, you can't turn off your phone, and all day, every day, all night, all you're doing is getting ping, 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 ping. People break. They don't want to deal with this anymore. So they hit the checkbox just to make it stop. And it is incredibly, incredibly effective. It works way more often than it should. We saw that attack repeatedly in this particular incident. Now, it's not just MFA fatigue. Increasingly, we're seeing social engineering become a bigger and bigger part of the attack surface. Adversaries realize it is very, very easy to compromise a user when compared to compromising a hardened, protected system. So what we typically see is vishing, voice phishing. Now, these stories have gotten better and better. Uh, they can tell very, very convincing stories tends to fall in two different buckets. They're either gonna be your friend or your adversary. So they'll come at you and say, look, there's an issue going on, we really need your help, there's something down in production, we really need you to be able to help us out. We already have your credentials, don't worry, but we have to get past MFA. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up a, a login session here in a minute, I just really need you to help me out, this is really gonna help keep the business running. Those types of, of lures, very effective. The flip side of that, is they will come at you with a stick, saying, I'm part of the security team. There's an incident going on right now that involves your account. There's potential for there to be millions of dollars in damage unless you help me get into your account. Again, I'm gonna initiate the login because I have your username and password, but you need to do this. Your job is on the line. This decision is going to affect your future in this company. Those types of pressure points can be incredibly effective on users. They're going to fall for that. They wanna help and they're afraid about losing their job. One of those two things is gonna hit most users. They're going to click the button, unfortunately. So what happens when they do bypass MFA? What are the things that adversaries do after the fact? So first and foremost, they are going to go after mobile device enrollment. Why? MFA bypass is annoying. It's a pain, it's difficult, it's tedious. It's much easier for them to be able to enroll their own device. So now, when they go to log in, they don't have to worry about MFA fatigue. They don't have to worry about trying to social engineer you. They are now getting your prompts on their phone. Additionally, they're going to immediately look at alternative ways to maintain their access. So one of the most common things we see is addition of users and adding to administrative groups on the systems that they're trying to maintain access in. And then finally, they're going to work to prep escalate privilege. Uh, and that's done for a variety of reasons, right? They're, they're trying to further their access. They're trying, if they're going for ransomware, they're trying to get domain admin to be able to deploy it widely. They're trying to get access to as many systems as they can so they can start hunting for data to exfiltrate. These are the types of things that adversaries do. And let's kind of flip and talk a little bit about tooling and what they do when they get on the box. And this kind of falls in line with what we continue to see time and time again on the landscape. Widely available offensive tools. We see them used constantly. 
Uh, in this case, we saw Mini Duke, we saw uh, Cobalt Strike, we saw a bunch of different off oh, Impacket as well. We see a bunch of these offensive security tools that are out there. I mean, today, your Cobalt Strike beacon, the alert that you get, that could be anything from a script kitty looking to drop a crypto miner to a ransomware extortion group looking for a foothold to potentially a nation state logging in and trying to conduct an espionage campaign. All of this all looks the same, all generates the same alert. These are the types of challenges that we face. Now, when they do get on these systems, what we see time and time again is living off the of land binaries. Adversaries typically aren't downloading their own tools, right? They're using what's already there. In this case, we saw PowerShell ad nauseum. NTDS util was used. There's so many, WMI. There's so many living off the land binaries, and every adversary is doing the same thing. Regardless of goal, regardless of sophistication, they're using the tools that are available, whether it be offensive security tools, living off the land binaries, and then increasingly, legitimate remote access tools. Now, why do they use legitimate remote access tools? It's simple. Vendors can't block them. We can't block LogMeIn, can't block TeamViewer. We sure can't block Microsoft RDP. These are all legitimate enterprise tools. Adversaries know that. That's why they're using them. You can't block them. If you use them in your environment, there is no way for you to be able to differentiate. Is this just a tech support call? Is this someone trying to get help on their, their desktop? Or is this a nation state logging in, potentially launching a very, very uh, sophisticated campaign? Now, we did get fortunate. This particular adversary did something that we don't typically see, which is that they deployed a custom backdoor. And that was our first hint at who the potential adversary would be. Now, when you start combining that with a couple of other indicators, it really started to, to crystallize our view of who the adversary was. Now, we saw this user created, this user Z, uh, with, with a specific password, adding it to specific groups. We'd seen this before in instant response engagements. So this is the first time that we really were able to, to kind of draw with certainty, with increasing certainty, that this actor is someone called Unc2447. It's kind of an unknown actor, uh, primarily associated with access. They operate in the ransomware extortion domain. Uh, they were Russian language speaking. Uh, and we knew from experience that eviction of this adversary was going to be difficult. Regardless, we moved forward and evicted the adversary. Uh, they immediately worked to reestablish access. Uh, they did this through a variety of means. One of the things that they did is they tried to make use of passwords and credentials that they'd already exfiltrated in the previous campaigns that they were running. During this incident, they were able to gain access to credentials, and they tried to use those credentials immediately to reestablish access. The other thing that they did, they took advantage of poor password reset hygiene. You all know these. Summer 22 bang becomes fall 22 bang. Those types of things still happen an annoying amount of the time. And look, these adversaries are not dumb. They can use password crackers. They see the patterns, and they're going to immediately try and exploit what they know is going to be the next password you use. So please, don't do password bang one and then password bang two, because the adversaries are going to figure this stuff out. The other thing that we saw repeatedly, log destruction. I mean, that's not that uncommon. Adversaries are always working to clean up their tracks, right? This is why centralized logging is so important. If you don't have centralized logging, the odds of your logs being preserved on systems that bad guys are compromising is very, very, very low. And then interestingly, we did see them kind of employ some, some novel techniques that are known, but we don't typically see super often. Among them, sti the sticky key login bypass. So this basically is a way where you can mess with the accessibility settings remotely, go to an RDP session, and then instead of pulling up the accessibility menu, pull up a command prompt. It allows you to do all your damage without actually having to log into the system. We saw all these techniques done by the adversary over time. So what was their goal? What were they trying to do? Uh, I said before that they kind of lived in the ransomware extortion space. Uh, it became clear over time that data exfiltration and extortion was the key goal. Uh, we blocked them repeatedly, attempting to exfiltrate data. What they ended up doing was exfiltrating. They got access to a box folder at some point. They ended up exfiltrating that data, and that's the, the stuff that ended up showing up on the leak site later on. Uh, 
I don't have time to go really deep on this, but what I really wanted to do was say, if you want to read the details, we tried to be as forthright as we possibly could, provide as much intelligence and detail. We mapped everything out to the, to the MITRE ATT&CK framework, really trying to show y'all what happened and how we responded. Okay, I'm gonna leave you with lessons learned. So there are kind of three key things that we learned in this process. Uh, first and foremost, you really need to harden your MFA. It is incredibly important to make sure that you have a handle on device enrollment and prompting to users and, and have things in place to combat MFA fatigue. These types of attacks are incredibly common and the mechanisms that they use are repeated time and time again. If they bypass MFA, they're immediately gonna do device enrollment. So make sure that you have those processes hardened and are ready to handle this eventual uh, adversary attention. Second, social engineering. It needs to be a prominent part of your user education program. It is everywhere. Social engineering keeps coming up in IRR, our IR engagements, incident response engagement after incident response engagement. They keep saying social engineering was part of this. They used vishing. They came after them via SMS. This avenue is incredibly successful and incredibly popular across all adversaries. I mean, look at Lapsus. They're having incredible success and their primary attack mechanism is just social engineering. Now finally, the last thing. One of the things that we realized is one of the major challenges that we have is in the hybrid world that we live in, it's about figuring out how to secure users who are using disparate systems that are running disparate stacks, technology stacks, that are lo located in disparate locations. How do we work to try and make sure that we can leverage the events that we're seeing across this wide array of sources and wide array of locations to drive not just detection, but also response. And that's really where kind of our, our thought process for XDR started to, to come from. So I'm gonna bring AJ back up to kind of drive a little bit deeper on what we did in XDR and kind of how we approached it. Thank you, Nick. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't overstate how fun it is to get to work with and learn from this guy every single day. So I feel incredibly blessed and fortunate. Um, if you have a chance, um, find them afterwards and just chat with them. So, so what's the answer, right? If, if Cisco struggles with, and again, to be clear, like from my perspective, and I think from all of you guys' perspective, prevention is always the number one goal, right? Like, let's prevent them from getting in. That's the goal of any security company. And if you do prevention right, you arguably don't need to detect and respond to anything because you've kept them out. But we as defenders have to be right 100% of the time. An attacker only has to be right once, and then they're in, and they're continuing to evolve. And if we have this hard of a problem at Cisco, detecting something like this and responding, as well-resourced as we are, how are less-resourced organizations supposed to have a chance? And what I would suggest is that extended detection and response across the ecosystem gives us our best chance. But first we have to define that so that we all know what we're kind of talking about here because there's a lot of marketing fud out there as much as I love my marketing counterparts, right? There's a lot of marketing being bombarded from different companies defining it in different ways. And I'm not gonna define it from Cisco's perspective. We came across a definition from IDC. IDC is a large research organization out there and we saw this definition and I liked it so much because of its clarity, its conciseness and also its completeness. Now, IDC says that in its most simplest form, XDR is three things. It's the collection of telemetry from multiple sources, multiple being the operative word there. It's the application of analytics on that collected telemetry in order to detect something malicious in your environment. And then it is the response and remediation of that maliciousness. Very, very complete, very, very simple. Now what IDC also will say is that the need for XDR is driven by the changing nature of the adversary. I don't have to make that point again. Nick just talked to you about UNC 2447 that's using all of these different tactics and techniques. But different adversaries are relying on different tactics and techniques. They're no longer just using malware, right? If they are using malware, they're, they're deploying it at the very end. Sometimes it's multi-stage, but they're, work, they're using things like social engineering, watering hole attacks, et cetera, et cetera. And it's this changing nature of the adversary and the sophistication, or at least the sophisticated tactics and techniques that they have access to which is driving the need for XDR. <clears throat> so 
So let me talk to you about a different adversary for a second. And I'm going to make a statement that says only an effective XDR solution can detect and respond to an adversary like Turla. So who's Turla? Some of you may know Turla is the adversary that was emulated in this year's MITRE Ingenuity Round 5 testing. They have a couple of nicknames, Snake, Venomous Bear, Water Bug. I don't know where that one came from. But Turla is associated with the Russian Federal Security Service. That association was made by the Estonian Intelligence Organization. Turla likes to do things like use things like watering hole attacks. They rely on phishing. They use highly, highly crafted lures, typically product updates. Sometimes they'll fall back on kind of current events to try to get somebody to click on something in an email. They don't always deploy malware. But if they do, they'll deploy it in stages. So they'll use the first stage of really unsophisticated malware to kind of down select the potential targets that they identify. And then they'll deploy the more sophisticated stuff on those high value targets. They'll save the really good stuff for the high value targets if they decide to deploy malware. This is a sophisticated adversary, similar to ONC2447 and some of the other ones that we know about. But this is also Turla. So it's a little hard to read. But what this is, is this is the MITRE attack matrix of all of the tactics and techniques that Turla will use that was emulated in this year's ingenuity testing. There's over 100 of them. We've color coded them by the product that is probably best able to detect and respond. <clears throat> so in red are endpoint detection and response solutions. The dark blue is network and firewall logs. Green is email, phishing. Light blue is kind of multiple technologies. The point here, though, is that if Turla is going to deploy multiple tactics and techniques where different point product solutions may be best suited to detect that tactic and technique, which means if you're not that point product or solution, you're not very well suited to detect it. A sophisticated adversary is going to find their way through your organization or into your organization by taking advantage of your weakest link. And only by collecting multiple telemetry sources and applying analytics on it do you have a chance of detecting and responding to a sophisticated adversary like a Turla. And again, going back to that statement of those organizations who don't think the sophisticated adversaries are going to target them, I'll go back to that WannaCry ransomware, which was a derivative of an, of an exploit developed by a very sophisticated adversary that fell into the hands of relatively unsophisticated actors that they then used. We asked a number of customers, what are the most important sources of telemetry for XDR if the collection of multiple telemetry sources is part of the definition of it? What they told us is that the three most important sources of telemetry for XDR are endpoint, as you saw from the prior slide, followed by network, and then firewall. Why is network so important? Well, it's because adversaries don't land on your high value assets in your data center. They don't land on your domain controller. They land on your endpoint, on your laptop, they exploit a vulnerability, and then they move laterally through your network to get to the high value assets, contact a C2 server out on the internet, and start exfiltrating data. And if you're not looking at that network traffic, and again, similar thing during the solar winds incident that Cisco struggled with, like a lot of other people struggled with, it was only by being able to look at that network telemetry correlated all the way back down to the endpoint and the process and the subprocess and the command line arguments that were passed to it that were running, were we able to be able to determine malicious connections versus legitimate connections. And then if you look at the next three after those first three, identity, email, and DNS, this highlights the point that SOC operators and defenders know that they have to look at all of these different telemetry sources if they're ever going to have a chance of being able to detect these sophisticated adversaries so that they can ultimately get them out of their environment. We also asked these same folks, what are the biggest challenges that you have with XDR solutions today, XDR or some of your current solutions today? And the two answers that came back, and this is why we're here today, the two answers that came back was lack of integrations across third-party security vendors, and lack of automation. Not lack of ability to automate, but lack of knowing what I need to automate, lack of having the expertise to actually write the automations, and lack of knowing that 80% of this stuff can be automated, but maybe not 100%. But what is the 20% that I leave my highly trained people to be able to go focus on? And so this is what SOC operators and defenders are struggling with, is this lack of integration. And this is why I would suggest that XDR has to unite this industry if we're going to solve this problem. And then lastly, what they need is they need those analytics. Now, again, remember, IDC defined it as the application of analytics to detect something malicious. And all of these operators agree with them. 
They say security analytics is the most important feature followed by threat intelligence. And you need things like case management systems, but there's really great case management providers out there. ServiceNow, for example. Almost every single organization in the world has a ServiceNow or Jira or something like that. And so if you integrate with things like case management systems and you integrate with things like threat intelligence and you recognize that this is a heterogeneous technology stack world and a heterogeneous community that we live in, it's only those integrations that are gonna allow all of these systems to work together to be able to deliver these outcomes. So what is necessary here? You need a place to put the telemetry. You need a set of inputs, both third party and native, to bring it in and correlate what is local to your environment with the threat intelligence that you know about bad stuff out on the, out on the internet, the World Wide Web, so that you can determine whether or not that connection from inside your environment is going out to somewhere legitimate or not. And most importantly, you need to have the context specific to your organization so that you know how to respond. And here's what I mean by that. Nick showed you a lot of different tactics and techniques. How many of you are familiar with the MITRE ATT&CK framework? Just a show of hands. Awesome. So you know that kind of the further right that you move in the framework, the worse those tactics or techniques are, right? Like reconnaissance is generally not as bad as exploitation, which is generally not as bad as data exfiltration, right? Like it gets worse as you go right. Now, that doesn't mean that they're not all bad, but reconnaissance on a low value asset or context, right, or data exfiltration on a low value asset or context might be a different priority for your organization than reconnaissance or data exfiltration on a high value asset. What do I mean by that? Data exfiltration, far to the right, really bad from a tactic and technique perspective, on a summer intern's laptop, probably not that bad. Isolate the laptop, remote wipe it, send IT to go re-image it, get the summer intern back up on their way. Reconnaissance on the left, on my CEO's laptop, maybe worse, right? Like, and so like you have to know and you have to be able to apply that context to your organization along with those tactics and techniques in order to be able to inform your decisions. You need a place to be able to take action, do things like case management, have the analytics, do the correlation, and then ultimately it's about the outputs. It's what am I gonna do with this? How am I gonna detect? How am I gonna respond? How am I gonna recover? How am I gonna learn from that so that hopefully I never get exploited the same way a second time? And then how am I gonna continue to improve my posture over time? And customers need to be able to consume this in multiple ways. There's some customers who have the people in their SOC who can manage these platforms for them. There's some customers who do not want to hire those people or cannot hire those people and want to outsource it to a managed service provider. The point of this slide though is if you agree and say these are the fundamental building blocks of an ideal XDR solution, no one vendor can provide all of these capabilities. They certainly can't provide it and have a best of breed point function, if you will, that is necessary in order to be able to detect and respond to a sophisticated adversary. It's only by bringing in the expertise of these different vendors from a case management perspective, from a threat intelligence perspective, from a data repository perspective, and combining these, do we stand a chance against sophisticated adversaries like Turla? So XDR must unite this industry. And we have to stop talking about features and shift the focus to outcomes. The goal of any solution from a detection and response perspective is to detect sooner to prioritize by the impact to my organization so that I know what steps I need to do, to be able to speed up the investigations and not spend endless amounts of time investigating till you know, our heart is content because that's what we like to do and we're all curious and skeptical by nature and we love to sit in our sim and hunt around for the needle in a stack of needles, but really compress that time as quickly as possible to get those adversaries out of your environment, get back up and running and recover. And we have to think about how we ask ourselves some of these questions continuously and measure ourselves because the goal is to be able to get better over time. But these are the outcomes we have to focus on from an extended detection and response perspective that can only be delivered by uniting the industry. And I'll leave you with this. This is my last slide and then we'll open it up for some questions. I think we have some questions um, at the end. If you think about the journey that we have to take, both individually and as an organization and really as a community, has to start by integrating. And this is where you as customers in the room can force us as vendors to integrate. It's your data. 
you're the customer, you can tell the vendors, we need you to integrate because it's the only way that we can achieve the outcomes that we need to in order to keep our organization safe and ultimately keep you safe as a vendor of mine because you're also probably a customer of mine, back to that statement that I made at the beginning. We have to unify, we have to build an ecosystem that aggregates and enriches this data so that we can detect these adversaries, ideally across our organization, across our industry, and maybe even across the much larger industry of all of the different you know, companies that work together. We want to orchestrate the actions that we need to take, the response and remediation actions, automate the 80% that we know that we can just automate, isolate and quarantine that summer intern's laptop, remote wipe it, send IT, open a ticket, have them re-image it. But if that same tactic or technique is targeting your Oracle database in, the, in, in your data center, you probably don't want to remote wipe that thing, right? You need to have a very customized, targeted response, which is where you want your smartest people going and figuring out what the right thing to do is. And then finally, you want to optimize. We have to continue to get better here because the adversary is continuing to optimize. They're taking advantage of every technology that they have at their disposal. You saw it from Nick. They're going to continue to do that. And the two advantages that they have at their disposal that we don't have is one, they aren't encumbered by the rules of society that we all enjoy and love. They don't care about society rules. And two, they're not encumbered by the rules of law. They don't care about laws, they're gonna break the laws. So those two advantages right there make them very, very hard to defend against. But I don't think it's impossible because of the 150 people who are in this room who seem to feel the same way. But we're not gonna get there by operating in isolation, we're only gonna get there by locking hands, stacking hands, combining forces, and really focusing on these outcomes. With that, I'll leave you with this. If you're interested to see how we think about this problem, I would invite you to come by the Cisco booth, both in the North Hall and the South Hall. We announced a new offer around this. Again, um, taking advantage of some of these learnings and also really focusing on some of these outcomes. Would love to get your thoughts, as well as if you're a vendor with an alternative solution, or something that we could integrate with, would love to learn how we can integrate better for you, better with you, in order to deliver those outcomes for our mutual customers. Thank you guys for your time. If you have any questions, we're happy to take them. <laughs> yeah, do you want to step up? Can we turn the mic on? Can we turn the middle mics on? Yeah, yeah hello. Thank you. Um, excellent talk. Um, uh, this integrated approach makes a lot of sense to me. Now, my question is, um, if I implement such a comprehensive framework, does this replace some of the previous uh, defense systems like CM, SOAR, or does it just come on top of it? Um, I, I think it depends. So another piece of research that we did, those same 300 customers we asked, we asked them, will XDR replace your SIM? Or vice versa, will SOAR, or I mean, will SIM consume your XDR, right? Um, on the margin, some people will say 10% of the people, I think, said SIM will consume XDR completely. Um, about 30% said that we think that XDR will replace SIM. And then there was about 60% in the middle that said that we think that they will live side by side um, indefinitely. Now, what I would suggest is that um, SIMs focus on aggregation of structured data, logs, and really long-term storage of that for compliance reasons. That's how they started. You obviously have the ability to do some detections, but it requires the person to be able to go in and write rules and know what rules that they need to write in order to fire off detections and then also maintain those rules. And if you have people who have that expertise and know how to do that, you can do that in a SIM. But an XDR is not about long-term storage of structured logs, it is about relatively short-term ingest of telemetry and the correlation and not having to know what rules to write, but relying on the analytics to be able to detect those adversaries and then drive those automated response actions. And so it really all comes down to how you do the detection because detection without response is insufficient, but response, which is what a SOAR focuses on, without the detection is impossible. And so SIM and XDR have a couple different ways that you can do the detections, but I would suggest that XDR, that they are very separate, because one's about aggregation and the other one is about correlation. Other questions? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Hi, so my question is about the um, 
use of artificial intelligence in that detection scenario, right? So you, you, you did have AI and ML as part of your orchestrate section of, of XDR. When we look at being able to apply models, and, and you also mentioned that one of the top priorities was to get the best possible threat intelligence. The threat intelligence sometimes is a static. It's just, these are the indicators of compromise. This is what we know. If we see this, we act. But what about correlating the entire context into an artificial intelligence or ML model that can derive decisions based not just on indicators of compromise, but on everything else that we see in the environment? How do we keep those models to be effective and avoid drifting into hallucination? Yeah, so um, I'll let Nick talk about the threat intelligence piece in just a second because he is far um, better to talk to it than I am. I'll say on the um, MLAI piece, um, while there's a lot of talk around generative AI right now, um, machine learning, I mean, which I think of as separate, you know, from AI, but I'm not an MLAI expert, but like machine learning or really um, supervised and unsupervised learning to be able to detect anomalies from a, from a baseline. Right, has been going on for years. And so we use machine learning on things like network anomaly detection. We can process lots of network. We know what good network traffic looks like. We can baseline it. Same with endpoint. You know what um, good process trees look like. You know what a bad process execution tree looks like. You can use things like machine learning to identify those anomalies in order to be able to detect it. Some of the newer AI, like generative AI, is really, really interesting. We're looking at it for, you know, from a company perspective, as are a lot of other people. But I would leave you with this also. Ask your vendors when they're talking about it. The thing that's a little worrisome about generative AI is that when it is wrong, it is confidently wrong. Confidently wrong. Like, it's very hard to actually figure out what's wrong in there because it wraps it with 99% of stuff that is right. And it is so damn confident that it is right that it is very hard to suss it out. Now, in a security operations center, um, this might be a bit of a controversial statement. In a security operations center, there are times when it's probably OK to be confidently wrong. And then there are times when it's not OK to be confidently wrong at all. So what are two examples of that? Um, generative AI actually can summarize an incident by feeding it in a set of, like, tactics and techniques with timestamps really well. So we can take a set of MITRE tactics with timestamps, feed them in in table form, and say, generative AI, chat GPT, in three paragraphs, tell me what happened here. And it spits out three paragraphs that is pretty damn good and pretty damn good. Like, holy cow, like, that's amazing. And so if you think about that going into a case management system or a work log, or the SOC operator having to tell the CISO what the hell happened, Right? And not sending them a list of TTPs, but sending them three paragraphs of really well-structured text of basically what's wrong. And maybe if there's one little nit in there that, that's not quite accurate, who cares? Like, is a CISO going to know? Yeah, probably not. Like, it's probably good enough. That's one of those cases where it's probably OK. What's a case where it's not OK to be confidently wrong? Really in those automation actions, right? Like, if you're using generative AI to automate some things and it's confidently wrong, that you should update that firewall rule table and now you can no longer get access to the internet in order to like run your business, that's probably a problem and you're probably gonna be looking for a new job. So we have to be somewhat judicious. And I haven't even talked about like the public disclosure of some of these tactics and techniques and potentially that being a violation of disclosure rules if you're in a regulated industry because it all goes into the public domain. Like we have to think through those, we're thinking through those at Cisco, but also even in the application of some of these newer technologies, there's areas where we can accept some of the deficiencies knowing what they are there's other areas where we can't. So I would encourage you to ask your vendors how they're thinking about that. On the threat intel side, do you want to say anything? Yeah, so from a threat intelligence perspective, we kind of have to move past IOCs being the, the, the way that we look at threat intelligence. Today, it's more about context, right? Because an IOC kind of leads you down a path. So since everybody looks the same, all the tools are the same, all the tooling is the same, by leveraging those IOCs to be able to say confidently, okay, so this is actually associated with a known campaign. It's not really something to be concerned about as opposed to we've never seen this before. This, this version of, of Cobalt Strike isn't common. Like those types of things can really help drive how and why you should respond to incidents accordingly. So I look at threat intelligence as the conduit to get us to context to not just give you a list of IPs and domains, but give you an idea of who the actor is, what the threat is, and what challenges you're gonna be facing because of it. Thanks, Nick. We're getting the, uh, the hook at the back of the room, so we're at time. I wanna say thank you to everybody here. Welcome again to everybody if this is your first RSA.
Come by the booth, see how we're thinking about this problem. We would love to get your feedback and show you what we've been working on for the last year.